Hey everybody, welcome to episode number five of Patterson in Pursuit. My goodness, this is a fantastic episode. I'm talking with Dr. John Stewer, who is the Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at Emory University in Atlanta, and we are talking about American pragmatism. Now, if you don't know anything about American pragmatism, don't worry. It's a philosophical tradition that's been around for over a century, and we start the interview talking about the very basics, and then we go into more and more complexity. There are several awesome features of this interview, not least of which is that my own philosophy is just about the opposite of American pragmatism. And two, I don't know that much about American pragmatism. From what I have read, I strongly disagree with a lot of the central claims, but that makes for fantastic conversation. Things get a little heated. You'll hear about 30 minutes in or so, we're doing well, we're on the same page, there's not a lot of tension, I'm learning a lot. And then I keep asking questions and trying to learn, and things got a little bit of tense. It might have been partly due to my own framework that I was bringing to the table. The, my own analytical framework was very hard for me to get around, but it just turned into a fantastic conversation. I'm so grateful that Dr. Stewart took over an hour to talk with me to try to get these ideas through my head. I'm certain that if you guys enjoy philosophic conversations, you're going to get a lot from this interview. So make sure you listen from beginning to end, because as we go along, there's just so many good nuggets of information here. In fact, what I'm going to do is the next episode, episode number six, I'm going to do a breakdown episode where I'm going to talk about the interviews that I've done so far, and I'm going to give you kind of my own analysis and take on them. And I'm going to spend a lot of time specifically on this interview because there's so much to unpack. So I really hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. John Stewart of Emory University. He's written several books on this topic. He is a legitimate expert when it comes to American pragmatism. And as you listen, if you have some commentary you'd like to add, please find my YouTube channel, leave a comment there, or send me an email, because I'm trying to learn about this philosophy. I think it's very important in terms of the history of ideas, and I'd love to talk to people that are knowledge more knowledgeable than I am on this subject. All right, enjoy the interview. So first of all, thank you very much, okay. Dr. Stewart, for sitting down and speaking with me today. You're welcome. It's nice to do. A lot of your work focuses on pragmatism, which is a philosophy I'm very interested in. Can you give just a brief summarization in a couple of paragraphs? What is the philosophy of pragmatism? Sure. Well, that's a little bit. Uh, yes, I can. And of course, that's, uh, you know, it's always a, a risky thing to reduce an entire philosophy to a soundbite of 25 <laughs> words or less, right? And so I think that it is worth stressing one of the things that your question says, which is that it is an entire philosophy. And so pragmatism is not simply an epistemology. Um, some people know pragmatism through epistemology and through a theory of truth, but pragmatism is a, a much broader philosophy. So I would say that pragmatism, right, and so how would one characterize any ism, right? And, and so you could think about these are the doctrines that one must believe to be mm -hmm. a pragmatist. These are the necessary and sufficient conditions of being a pragmatist. A more pragmatic way of answering that question would be to talk about the temperament of pragmatism. When James talks about the temperament um, and that people choose and hold philosophies because of their temperament or vision. So pragmatism is a clearly uh, empirically oriented philosophy. It is pluralistic. Uh, it is fallibilistic. And I guess the, the key point here for pragmatism is that it tends to um, reverse the traditional priority of theory and practice and take practical matters to be crucial. Right? And so it both wants to evaluate beliefs in terms of their practical consequences but more generally, it wants to evaluate theory in terms of practical consequences. That's wonderful. So let's dive into that a little bit. Um, so the theory of, or the uh, the philosophy of pragmatism has multiple parts. You can kind of say it has an epistemological component. Does it have a metaphysical component? Is there? A, is there? Sure. Okay. Yeah, it has a metaphysical component, and I think that um, the core of pragmatism is actually the moral component, the ethical moral. component. Excellent. Uh, pragmatists tend to view epistemology as a subset of ethics. Uh, philosophers like Peirce and James view the true, in the words of William James, the true is the good with respect to knowledge. Right? And so the, the broader category is the good, and truth is just one kind of good. It's the epistemological knowledge kind of good. Right? And so I think that it does have a metaphysics, but the, the real sort of uh, beating core of pragmatism is uh, kind of an ethical stance. That is fascinating. So how would the pragmatist respond to the kind of intuitive um, uh, question or the intuitive idea that there is such a thing as 
truth out there, that it's kind mm. of an objective metaphysical truth and there are, are epistemologically truth, true and false things that you can say, what is the pragmatist say that the questions of objective truth are secondary to the pragmatic consequences? Right, right. so um, one good, uh, slightly sloganistic, but one, one good way to sort of understand uh, a pragmatist position on most any issue, and I'll come to this one, is to take whatever the traditional philosopher's dualism is and just to deny it, right? And so is truth subjective? No. Is truth objective? No. Neither one of those. Right. And so in, you said in response to the question about sort of truth is just out there and objective, the pragmatists, for the most part, and there are debates within pragmatism, like any theory, there are, are multiple positions within it. But um, in, in the work of, of many of the best known pragmatists, people like William James and John Dewey, later people like Richard Rorty, um, truth is not out there waiting to be discovered. That metaphor of discovering an already existing truth uh, makes no sense for them. Truth is something that's made rather than discovered. Um, <clears throat> truth for pragmatists is a property of belief. The, things aren't true or false. We sometimes talk that way. We say, like, you're my true friend. But what mm -hmm. we really mean is, like, you're really my friend or you're a good friend or something like that. The only things that are true or false are beliefs, and there's no beliefs independent of believers. And so there is no non-human connected Truth. Truth is just a property of belief. And does that apply to what we consider to be the external world? So would you agree with a mm -hmm. sentence like, without a mind or without believers, there would be no such thing as truth? Does that imply that there is no external world as we conceive it? That all there is is just minds? Right. So again, that's a kind of traditional dualism of mm -hmm. if there's no external, is there then only internal? And again, the pragmatist view is, no, both of those languages of the external and the internal are mistaken. So it's okay. not, if it's one, it's not the other. Um, some philosophers think that reality is objective and independent of minds. Some think that uh, reality is somehow mind-dependent. Um, the pragmatist view is that both of those are wrong, right? Okay. And so... Uh, a lot of the traditional views in philosophy that philosophy students in introductory courses are taught as being opposite of one another. Um, there's empiricism and rationalism. There's Plato and Aristotle. There's objectivism and subjectivism. For most pragmatists, those are not very interesting intramural debates that actually are debates. Be so I call them intramural because they are debates between two positions that have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. We tend to classify philosophies by their answers, right? What do they say? A, a kind of standard pragmatic way of approaching that is to say, like, let's classify philosophies by their problems. What do they ask? And so in separating the external and the internal and having some people pick the external and some people pick the internal, those people agree on the way that the, the, the issue is phrased, right? And so for pragmatists, thinking about an external reality or a reality creating independent mind makes no sense. One of the things that William James points out uh, in Principles of Psychology is that um, there is no object, right? there, there is nothing except as it presents itself to someone, mm. right? And so there is no independent reality, but at the same time, there is no internal mental state, there is no state of consciousness except as of something else. Okay. Right? And so there's no way to disassociate the in and the out, the self and the object. These things are integrally, irreducibly, reciprocally linked. Okay, so would you agree with um, a, a something like this? If I were to try to rephrase this and say, two people who are making what appear to be mutually exclusive claims, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're talking about you know the pencil that's on or the pen that's on the table. I say something about it. You say something about it. Really, we're not talking about the same objective thing. We're just kind of reporting on our own internal experience that may or may not have similarities to it. No. No. no, we really are talking about the same thing, yeah. or, or at least it's quite possible. I mean, mm -hmm. w with further inquiry, it could turn out that we're not talking about the same right. thing. But um, with an example like that, the odds are good that what you're talking about when you refer to the pen on the table is the same thing that I have in mind mm -hmm. when I talk about the pen on the table. Um, if you claim that the pen is X, whatever X is, and I claim that it's not X, we're probably saying incompatible things. Okay we would then need some sort of, right? And so because pragmatists stress that truth is a 
result. It's a consequence of inquiry. It's not something that starts at the beginning. We would need to conduct some sort of experiment to see which one of us is true, right? We have to inquire further. So if so, so intuitively, I would think if if so, we disagree about some some uh, something in the world. Sure. Um, and let's say that you know I say it's blue and you say it's red. Does doesn't that imply then that there is such a thing as a, an external reality that we are evaluating and saying there is something that has these particular properties mm -hmm. that if you evaluate it differently than mine, your evaluation might be wrong and my, my, mine might be right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, no. <laughs> the answer is no <laughs> to that. Th there's no way, right? In other words, you could take this as sort of a pragmatic challenge and, and you could understand it as uh, tell me about anything as it is independent of your telling it. You know, it's kind of good luck with that one, right? Because mm -hmm. the minute that you begin to describe it, you are using your experience. You're presenting it from your point of view. If that's the case, couldn't we say then that mutually exclusive claims could be compatible in the sense that I'm just telling you about my experience as I'm having it? It, it could be if okay. that's if that's what you're doing, right? Okay. If you, which is right. So there's a bunch of analytical philosophers in the early 20th century who want to say things like, I'm being appeared to orangely. Right. And it's like, OK, if you if what you're really doing is not if you're talking in a kind of clunky way, not about the pen, but to report something about your internal states of mind. Sure, that might be true, too. Right. So the, the mo one of the most famous uh, examples uh, in all of pragmatism is the one that William James uses uh, at, at the beginning of his book, Pragmatism. And he talks about coming upon, he's out in the woods, and he comes upon a camping party that, I don't know whether you know this, and they're, um, they're involved in a heated philosophical argument. And the argument is about whether a man on the ground, one of them, as he walks, is walking around a squirrel or not. Uh, yes, I have. Right? And part. so the squirrel is on a tree, <laughs> and as the man moves, the squirrel moves so that it's always on the other side of the tree, right? And so some people are arguing yes, and other people are arguing no. And what James does is to say, it depends, right, which is the standard pragmatic move, which is essentially to say, like, before we can evaluate the truth or falsity of any claim, we have to know the meaning of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, right? So if you mean passing from the north to the east to the south to the west of the squirrel, yes, he goes around. If you mean passing from in front of the squirrel to the squirrel's side to the squirrel's back, mm -hmm. no, he doesn't, right? Now, in that case, then James reports people are very unhappy with him because he settled their argument and they were having great fun yelling with each other, <laughs> right? So James tells that story in part, right? And people read that and they think, oh, that's kind of a clever, slightly outdated little story, right? But he tells that story as a way of sort of suggesting that all kinds of traditional problems in philosophy are like that. They're the result of not being clear about what we mean. And mm -hmm. then if we clear up the meaning, the problem is dissolved, right? That doesn't mean that every problem is dissolved, right? Somebody could say like, no, no, when I say going around, I also mean passing from north to east to south to west. Mm -hmm. And I could say, I don't think he's doing that. And you could say, I think he is, right? And then James would say, well, then what would we do? We would bring in other inquirers. We would get a few compasses, right? And it may well turn out that you're just wrong, right? In other words, but being wrong isn't being wrong independent of experience. It's being wrong as experience shows. Okay. Rightness and wrongness are themselves experiential. Okay. So how would we take, uh, how would the pragmatist view a circumstance like this. Let's say I'm making a claim not about the objective world. I'm making a specific claim about your internal experience. Right. So I'm saying Dr. John Stewart is having the positive experience of jumping off a cliff right now. Right. Would this be something that, that you could say confidently if that is clearly communicated, this is certainly false. Yeah. So again, I want to just go back. You, you said, let's not talk about an objective. Mm -hmm. And I want to just stress for pragmatists, there's not objective or subjective. Okay. Right? If you use either of those language, you, you're just sort of confused from the beginning. Okay. Right. But if you want to switch from talking about like, the pen on the table to talking about sort of the experience that I'm having, um, whether jumping off a cliff or something else, yes, the pragmatist thinks just like anything else, I could be right about that mm -hmm. or I could be wrong about that. And whether I am would depend upon what the consequences show, right? And so, again, the, uh, the, the pragmatist thinks James says truth is a matter of consequences, right? And so um, if, I, if I believe that uh, drinking a glass of juice will refresh me, 
uh, we only know really for sure after I drink the glass of juice and we see what happens, right? And, and um, I could be wrong about that. And so in the language, uh, slightly professional, slightly um, erudite language of philosophers, um, I don't have any privileged access to my mental states. I, I could be wrong about that. Uh, you don't have privileged access to your own mental states? Correct. Or? Right. I, I, could okay. be, I could be mistaken about that. Right. I don't have any in principle access. Right. And so in the same way that you might have a better view of the pen than I do. Okay. Right. You might know something more. Right. And so another way to look at that is probably just don't think that we come uh, transparent to ourselves. There's things about myself I could be wrong about. Oh, that's fascinating. So uh, so let's uh, let's explore that a little bit. Is that um, true in all facets of your own kind of experience, even just basic conscious awareness? Yeah, the, the possibility of being wrong is, yeah. The possibility? Not, not actually being wrong, right? Okay. We're often right, otherwise it would be a really bad day. Right. But, but the possibility that that, yes. Even something like, okay, so what about a circumstance, let's say that you are listening to music, yeah. um, that you're having that, right. you're aware of listening to music. Would you say then that there is still a possibility, even though you are having the conscious experience of, of listening to music, that you aren't? Sure. Um, right. And so let me pick an even sort of maybe better one because it doesn't involve the outside music thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Somebody could say, I feel jealous. How could I be wrong about that? I mm -hmm. just feel jealous. Yeah. I'm just sitting here feeling jealous. It's a bad day. I feel jealous. Right. And the, the prime just think like, what is, what is it that you're asserting? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, if you're christening, right, in other words, like, so imagine you're born and your parents say, I will call you Stephen, right? And it's like, you can't be wrong about that because you're just naming something for the first time. Okay. Right. And so if all you're doing is sort of saying like, ah, 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 it's going on, right? I'm, I'm going to call it this, right? But if you say when you claim that you're jealous, if you're claiming that your experience is relevantly like other experiences that have been called jealous, uh -huh. you might be wrong. Right. Which is why somebody could talk with you for a while and say, you know what, now that we've talked a bit, I don't actually think that you are jealous. I think that you are envious. So, and you might and you might say, like, uh, wow, you're right. That is what's going on. So you'd say then, unless you are merely naming a, a novel experience that you're mm -hmm. having, you can't know whether or not that correlates to other experiences that you've had or or this package of things that we call jealousness right you can't if, know if you describe it what you're doing is essentially uh -huh. saying it's relevantly like these other things that have been described this way right, right? and that may or may not be the case right just even like, if it's even if it's internal so if i say something but it's not like, internal oh right, right? see i'm presupposing yeah, it's not you. in other words there's things going on in you but there's things going on in the world as well so let's say that there is this experience that i have had of uh, being aware of what I call blue. Sure. And I would say I have, I, I at least believe I have the memory of seeing this my whole life. Is that something that sure. I can't be certain of? Or could it? Well, again, on the pragmatist view, if we're talking about experience as opposed to a formal system, you can mm -hmm. be certain about 2 plus 2 equals 4. You can be certain about certain logical relations. You can't be certain about anything in experience. Okay. Every, right, which is why I said at the beginning that they're fallible. So I think it's always possible that you're mistaken. You don't ever have the complete story, right? But so, is that possible? It's not really a very interesting question. But yes, it, yes, it is possible, okay. right? What you're doing is saying like through my whole life. That's a kind of way of saying like, look, I have a lot of evidence for this, right? And so I go, okay, uh, you have a lot of evidence for that. Is it possible that you would be wrong? Yes, right. Just like you could be wrong about anything else. You could be wrong about a perception. You could say, is it possible that I'm wrong that that's a pen? I, I just put it down. Is it possible that somebody really fast replaced it with a hologram of a pen? Yes, that's possible. Is okay. there much evidence for that? N no. But right. So the, the, the notion of true or false in pragmatism is largely replaced by what I think is the much more sort of common sense notion of more or less warranted. Right. And so a, a, a laboratory scientist, in a way, isn't claiming this is true. What they're saying is we have a lot of evidence for this. Right. Or on the basis of my experiment, let's see if you can reproduce it. These are the results that I'm getting. This is a wonderful segue into the next thing that I wanted to talk about. You gave a little um, caveat. You said you can be certain about 
certain logical relations between things. Can we talk a bit about the role of logic or the analysis of logic in pragmatism? So some, if I were to say something like, you know, there are no married bachelors out mm -hmm. there in existence, is this is something that even the pragmatist would say, well, certainly that is true, but it's just kind of a linguistic thing that you're, that you're stating. You're just defining one of your Right, terms, linguistic right? or we could say conceptually, right? It's mm -hmm. sort of, we could say, philosophers sometimes say true by definition. Mm -hmm. Right, it's just sort of a formal system. You're essentially saying it's you're, what you're essentially doing is sort of saying x equals x, mm -hmm. right? And if somebody but you're going to call x right, this other thing, yeah, yeah. Right? And, and you're right, or two plus two equals four, mm -hmm. right? And if somebody says I don't think so, we don't take them out for more experience. <clears throat> what we do is ask them like, do you understand the concept of two? <laughs> do, do you get what equal means? Right, right, and right. and these things are true within that system. Okay, right. So would you say? Uh, Okay, what is the um, opinion of the, let's say, the law of non-contradiction and pragmatism? So is there any way, um, at least when we're talking about purely logical things, the pragmatist would say, just con you're, you've made kind of a, it's conceptually incoherent to say that you could have a married bachelor. You don't understand the meaning of the terms involved. There is no such thing. But is that a kind of a principle at large? Is there, is, can, can, does the pragmatist take a stance about in, in the world, there could not be such things as logical contradictions or paradoxes can't exist for the same reason that they're not even coherent things? Uh, yes, although the last thing you said makes me, gives me pause a second. Um, yes, there is a difference between truths that are true as a result of logical relations and truths that are so because of existential relations. Mm -hmm. And so... Pragmatists are wary of folks who think that in having proven something at the conceptual level, they've proven something at the real level. Mm -hmm. There can be paradoxes if what you mean by that is sort of um, uh, apparent evidence on both sides of something. But um, that paradox uh, for pragmatists in terms of experiential matter is experiential rather than logical. And so what that means is we need more inquiry. Mm -hmm. Right, and so a person thinks the 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 remedy for the shortcomings of inquiry is more inquiry. We we need to find out. Right? It looks like how could this be both of these things, or neither of them? Right, but upon finding out more, yeah. Would the would the in, the intuition would certainly be we need more inquiry to try to see what's going on here. Is there an entertaining of the idea that maybe? It, both of these things are true at the same time. Like um, mm -hmm. Eastern mysticism comes to mind. There's a mm -hmm. lot. There's a, a large group of people that say reality itself is experientially contradictory that you mm -hmm. can you can um, there's this un this metaphysical unity of opposites there's blackness and whiteness together at the same time in the same way and if that's a logical contradiction so be it i felt it right what would you say something like well that? so um yeah that, there's a couple of things there um if we're talking about experience or existing things the pragmatists say the language of contradiction doesn't apply there um, things aren't contradictions of the others. They're not opposites. They're just different. Um, the log and the pile of ashes are not opposites. They're just different things. The one became the other after it was burned, hmm. right? Um, so that to import the epistemology language of contradiction and opposite into existential matters is a kind of category confusion. One thing is not the opposite of the other. It's just different from the other. It's not the illogical opposite of the other. It's just different from one another, right? And so... Um, you know, uh, Walt Whitman, the poet, uh, mm -hmm. proto-pragmatist famously says, you know, do I contradict myself? Um, you know, fine, I'm large, I contain contradictions. Yeah. But, but what he means by that is uh, something temporal. So in your example, you're saying, can something be X and not X in the same respect at right. the same time? Mm -hmm. Right. And the pragmatist would say, like, there's no evidence that there that that could be. Um you know, show me something, give me some evidence. No, but can, right, can something over time become something else? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Um, so uh, this notion that um, experience is um, contradictory has little resonance with the pragmatist. The notion that experience is big, uh, contains uh, varieties, uh, contains wide differences, um, develops over time. That's what pragmatism is about. 
So mm -hmm. even even something like an extreme, let's say in um, in Hinduism, there's this idea of the unity of everything. It's mm -hmm. kind of a unity of everything and a denial of everything at the same time. It's it's that well, this is true in Hinduism. It's it's very explicitly true in Buddhism, where they say the only thing that's real is nothing, mm -hmm. is nothingness. Yeah. Um, D does that strike you as because I think that the, what the phrase you used a minute ago was we don't have any evidence of that mm -hmm. is that something that is open to evidence or is that like how we're defining Mary Bachelor is it just simply it just can't be that way right so we'd have to ask you right I mean we, we would sort of say which did you mean right mm -hmm. and if you're saying all I meant was I'm just sort of manipulating symbols within a kind of closed formal system that's what you meant it's not a matter of experience mm -hmm. which again is why in math classes People who don't understand something are not told to go outside and gather up sets of two and sets of two, right? They're, they're told, in fact, to sort of, this is not an empirical matter. We need to think conceptually here, right? Um, if someone's making a claim about the nature of experience, the pragmatists think then what we're looking for is evidence in experience, mm -hmm. right? If someone says um, uh, the only thing that is is nothing, right, the, the, the standard pragmatist move just like with the squirrel example, is to ask, what does that mean? Yeah. Right? In other words, what would have to happen in experience to show that that's so? Right? And then you go out and look and see whether that's so or not. Okay. Right? And so one could say, I don't really have any idea what you mean when you say the only thing that's real is nothing yeah. or, the, or the, the being is nothing. Right? So tell me what that means. Mm -hmm. Right? In the same way that somebody could say, I, I don't know in chemistry lab what you're talking about when you talk about an acid. What, what, tell me what that is. Mm -hmm. right? And so somebody said, what do you mean by nothing? Right? And if the response is, well, I can't say that. Right? Right. I can't right. tell it's you. It's ineffable. Basically. Yeah. Then the primary view is, well, then but there's no... That, right, then, I mean, then it can't be said, right? And um, uh, pragmatists all think that uh, at, at least almost all think anyway, qualify it that way, that experience outstrips language in, in the language of James. But um, if you can't describe something, then the idea of finding evidence for it makes no sense at all. Right? It's like, it'd be like my saying, like, there is a huge invisible pink elephant in this room. Mm -hmm. um, what do I mean by saying it's invisible and pink? I can't tell you, but check it out and see whether it's so. Mm -hmm. What would you do to look for it? There's nothing that you could do, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, in varieties of religious experience, um, James does something which I think is quintessentially pragmatic and also very helpful in that he essentially says, this is my, uh, this is the 25 words or less short paraphrase, right? But what he essentially does is to say to religious believers and non-believers of all stripes on all continents, uh, he says, if you report honestly that you have a certain kind of experience and if you are even the least bit literate and able to describe that experience i william james will believe that it went on right i'm having this kind of experience whether or not that experience gives rise to a belief that is true is an entirely separate matter i see right and so in the same way without sort of going in a kind of cosmic mystical way somebody could say uh you know as they're playing basketball uh, I could say, uh, wow, uh, that guy elbowed me. I, um, I have a dislocated rib, right? And that is a claim which, which later inquiry could show to be true or false, right? It could turn out, no, your rib wasn't dislocated. You're just bruised. Mm -hmm. But if somebody says, I'm having this painful experience, James thinks, sure, right? Which is why this book is called Varieties of Religious Experience. If all you're doing is describing your experience, then sure, if you're, again, if you're the least bit able at describing, we'll believe that this is going on, right? Maybe you're lying to me, maybe you're manipulating me, but setting aside those cases, if you're describing and saying, my life is like this, James thinks, sure, then my philosophy has to find space for your life. But if you think that your experience comes prepackaged with beliefs that are automatically true, James thinks there isn't anything like that. In that example, though, doesn't that kind of presuppose this distinction between um, the subjective and the objective that you can report your internal experience and we'll accept yeah, it. No, no, cause there's nothing internal, right? In other words, what you're saying is this is going on. And, and as oh, I said, to go I back, see. back to another example, somebody could say like, no, that's not what's going on. So does the pragmatist say then that the commonplace claims that we make about 
existent things in the world that uh, my rib hurts or this is over there, that is over there, are actually, uh, there's a premise, there's a mistaken linguistic premise in there that they, people think they're talking about the, an object of world, but in reality, all they're doing, unbeknownst to them, is reporting on their experiences. Well, you sort of say all they're doing is reporting on their experiences. No, they're reporting about things in the world, right? And then the question becomes, see, you're still talking in terms of these external, internal dichotomies, objective, subjective, almost all of the questions that you've asked have mm -hmm. those questions. And yeah. the pragmatist is saying those are all wrong. I'm, I'm trying so let, to, me, let yeah. me give you a different example. Yeah. You come out of a movie and, and suppose you say, wow, that was really scary. Yeah. Right? You're not saying I'm scared. You're saying the movie, that is a scary movie, right? What if... Your three friends say, that movie was not the least bit scary. You're just easily scared. You were scared. Yeah. Right? The pragmatists think both of those are ways of trying to describe the same kind of experience. One is locating the quality of that experience subjectively. The other is locating it objectively. Whether or not we do that depends upon our pragmatic purposes. Okay. So what would you, how would you respond to something like this? So I, what I would say is in that circumstance... The statement, that movie is scary, as a statement about the movie, is, is a confusion about language that you can Right, can't. because, yeah. and that sounds like sort of a traditional analytical view, right? Because you sort of think tertiary qualities don't belong to the thing. Right. Right, and it's again, the primary, right, and the primary view is like, that's completely wrong. Those are aspects of experience. I found the movie to be scary in the same way that I found it to last two hours and a half. But isn't that a different sentence to say, I found the movie to be scary versus the movie was had this particular dimension on the wall? The movie is scary. The movie doesn't have that particular dimension on the wall. It has that particular dimension on the wall as observed by us, to me, to some group of observers. Well, so it sounds, in my intuition is just to think that it sounds like there is a an intentional almost conflation to say that we can say sentences like the movie is scary very meaningfully. I mean, that's how we would yeah, say sure. that the movie is scary. But when we really want to be analytical and we want to say, well, what, is it, what do you actually mean by that? Then the response is, well, clearly I can say this in a meaningful way. Therefore, I can, I can get away with it. Where somebody, my intuition would be something like, oh, well, you... That's an, in, that's an imprecise way of communicating. If you think that you're making an, a claim about the movie versus reporting on your own experiences. Yeah, so I think the pragmatist view, again, there could be examples of people lying or manipulating, but if we set those aside for a second, um, if you claim the movie is scary, you are describing an experience. And that experience has both a subjective and objective pull. But what if I'm intentionally not trying to do that? So what, what if I'm trying to say there is, what if somebody is intentionally trying to describe something separate of their experience? That they, they can't, they can't do, do it. So it's impossible. So it is a confusion. So if somebody, so, so I guess that maybe I didn't phrase this accurately before. So what the pragmatist says is the appearance of evaluating objective things and having some kind of, some, there's something out there that we can report on is, is it has, contains a mistaken premise that all you can do is simply report on your experiences. Uh, no. Uh, again, that's wrong because you're saying <laughs> simply report. Okay, right? and so, so you're not reporting on your experiences. You're reporting on things in the world. You're reporting on nature. But the only th when we say the term "things in the world," it doesn't mean what like an analytic philosopher would think. Or yeah, well, I'm not. I'm not sure. We'd have to talk. I mean, analytical philosophy is a name almost incoherent term. But right, so okay. it means what later Wittgenstein means. Okay, it means what J. L. Austin means. Right? Is Rorty an analytical philosopher at one point in his life? Probably. It means okay. what some of them mean. Okay. Right? But things are not objective or subjective. That's a complete confusion. So that's the, that's the mistaken confusion. So when I'm a, like my, just my personal and default mindset is to think that there are things. But it, but the, the, yeah, there are things. Right? The primaries think there are things too. But what we mean by things is reporting on experience. Is it not as I am No, no, because what you're saying is reporting on something subjective. The opposite here, pragmatists are not saying no to objectivity so that they can affirm subjectivity. They're saying no to the subjective-object dualism. Okay. Either, way, either of those ways of speaking is equally wrong. They're wrong in different ways, but they're wrong in the same way in that they stem from starting out with a central confusion. So, but, so it, sound, it sounds like, and, and this is, I, I love this, this is excellent, because this is, this is kind of getting to the meat of what, I, what I'm trying to grasp here. It seems like the pragmatists would say that on the one hand, my mindset for thinking about the world contains this mistaken premise of this, there is this thing as the subjective and the objective. But on the other hand, it also sounds like you're saying, well, no, but those are both valid as well. 
Yeah. Okay. So again, the only thing that are valid are arguments. Things are not valid, right? That's a as analytical philosophy yeah, would teach. Yeah, yeah. That's a confusion. Yeah. Yeah. That was right? a, a loose term. Right. So. <laughs> so. But I mean, the terms are, are important here, right? And I think that it's probably. It, it'd probably be helpful to not sort of think like, what does the strange person called the pragmatist think? The, the pragmatists think that what they're doing is speaking a kind of common sense. Right. Right. And they're thinking philosophers who have been twisted around by a bunch of confusions often put these things in very odd ways. Right. right? And so the, the pragmatist thinks uh, when you make this description, you're sort of saying this is what I found to be going on. Mm -hmm. You probably, unless you're you know, a super all the time introspective guy, you probably think you're talking about other stuff. You're talking yeah. about things like pens and cliffs and mm -hmm. so on, movies. Right. And and are your claims about those things? Yes. Right. As, as Dewey says, we don't have experience of experience. We have experience of nature. Mm -hmm. Right. Those two things are always joined. Right. Um, Dewey tells he's not a very funny writer, but he tells the story of sort of the history of philosophy as uh, having shattered things into parts and then working to put them back together again. He sort of says that most of philosophy is a Humpty Dumpty project. Right. And so the question is, why would you shatter them into parts like that to begin with? Um, it's fine to say the movie is scary. It's fine to say that it's scared. If you come out in real life, if you come out and say the movie is scary and all of your friends, right, and everybody on Rotten Tomatoes and so on says, uh, this was a childish, uh, slightly boring movie, people are going to tell you the movie wasn't scary. You were just scared. Right? <laughs> and, Interesting. Right. And if everybody else comes out horrified here on end, they're going to say, like, well, that is a really scary movie. Okay, whether it's useful to put that description on the subjective pole or the objective pole depends upon our purposes, right? And the, the pragmatic view here is that when we make a distinction, what philosophers often do is cover up the reasons why they're making the distinction, right? So one of the things we do with words, right, is we distinguish things, mm -hmm. right? And the question becomes, for what purpose? Right. Why are you doing it this way rather than some other way? So what do you think about, so this is, a, this is such an interesting way of thinking about things. And it's interesting as well that this is labeled pragmatism because my, my default intuition, I, I'm sure is shared by some people, certainly not all people, sure. that this is almost a less pragmatic, in the, in, the, in the colloquial sense of the term, less pragmatic way of going about things to deny that there is this distinction between the subjective and the objective, because that seems very okay, intuitive. Let me just say, it's not to deny the distinction, right? To it's to deny the existential dualism. Right. There are not right. subjects and objects. These have a, they, they have no independent existence. Right. They are distinctions that we make, right? And, and so, so, yeah, and so Dewey at one point sort of says, like, this would be a good slogan for pragmatism. Dualisms, no. Distinctions, yes. Dualisms, no. Distinctions, yes. But so the so the question is. So then the, it, que the question that you ask about a distinction is uh -huh. not is it real or not, but you ask what use does it serve? Exactly. What is the what is the what's the purpose for it? But I still return to my earlier question, which doesn't that seem like a less pragmatic way of doing things? Because do, do you do you agree at least that the intuition is to think that the words that we're using have this relationship to the objective? in contrast, in this dualistic contrast to the subjective. Yeah, I don't think most people have that intuition. You don't think so? No. I, I think that whole way of speaking is a heavily philosophy way that most people don't have. When you tell them, like, don't, right? If, if what they mean is, right, if all you mean is, we usually encounter things that seem to be independent of us in many mm -hmm. ways, mm -hmm. the primary to say, obviously, that's true. Experience shows that to be the case, mm -hmm. right? Experience shows that the pen doesn't go out of existence when I look away. Right. right. We keep several cameras trained on it. I look away. It's still there. Right. But it, it anything like that, any kind of example like that doesn't show that the thing is somehow independent of experience, because, in fact, you're saying it's these other experiences, other people looking, cameras mm -hmm. being trained on it that show it. Just by virtue of the right. fact that people are even describing it, yeah. they're reporting that yeah. this is right. something that is experiential. Yeah. Right. And so I, I think that what we grapple with from science down to ordinary life is um Right. So why are scientists concerned with the repeatability of an experiment? Right. With getting the same result, because it's not because they're having fun doing the experiment necessarily. It's because we don't want to claim that the resulting beliefs are true 
unless the consequences show that they're repeatable, that they're found across experience. But isn't there a premise in science uh, and in any kind of empirical endeavor, isn't there kind of a presupposition that there is this external thing that we're measuring rather than just simply reporting on experiences that we're having? So again, it's really interesting how you put that. Rather than merely reporting on experiences yeah, I, that we're I, having, I, we, we, it's not yeah, merely, right. and it's not that we're having, right? The experience is no more mine than the objects. Right? When I see a telephone pole, it's not my experience. It's the experience of me plus telephone pole. It's not my experience. That's, uh, that whole way of putting it is, is fraught with all kinds of philosophical assumptions. Okay. So, so let me ask you this. That's a very interesting point. I never thought of that. Would you say that the uh, intuition of the existence of a kind of self, given the fact that this is a word, the self, sure. is just a label, yeah. All that there is is just the experience. Even thinking that there is my experience or your experience is already presupposing this dualism. No, I don't. No, I don't think that that's right. I mean, okay. the pragmatists have a view of the self. Okay. Right? And, and so uh, Dewey says, for example, that the, the self um, doesn't have. It's not a, a separate, substantial thing. It doesn't have a history. It is a history. It's a series of events. Is it independent from any other uh, series of events? Like Sh sure. It, but is there, is it's, there it's experience? Experience shows that it is right. In other words, it's why we say that that was your childhood rather than mine, right? It's because that set of experiences stands in a certain relation to your being here talking now, that my being here talking now doesn't have to it. But but is, isn't that doesn't that presuppose then that there is this thing that is kind of the external world in which there are two different um, chains of experience operating? Mm -hmm. Uh, if it depends what you mean by external, right? So again, the, the premise <laughs> is always going to say you need to define your terms before I can tell you if what you're saying yeah. is true or false. So if you mean by external something that experience shows doesn't depend upon my existence in certain ways, of course that's so. Well, well, isn't that a, it, it, isn't that a metaphysical dualism to say that there are mm -mm. there is a chain of events mm -mm. that is separate from another chain of event like mm -mm. experiences? Mm -mm. No, yeah. right? It would be like saying how many things are there in this room. Is it, a, it? Suppose I so I'm I'm gone way past dualism. I'll say there's 17, right? Or there's three, right? Mm -hmm. How many kinds of things are there, right? And the pragmatist view is that is a question about how is it helpful to make certain distinctions rather than others, mm -hmm. right? I could walk into a class and say how many kinds of students are there in here. One answer could be two. There's mm -hmm. male and female. The other answer could be four. There's freshman, sophomore, right? Somebody could say there's actually six people who are six feet tall, six feet one, six but feet two. Isn't that cleared up by just precise language? So yeah, it's exactly right, which yeah. is so that this whole language of external, objective, subjective, merely experience, that will be cleared up, according to the pragmatists, if, we, if we're more careful about it. So my, just in the way I'm trying to understand this, it seems like there is almost a, like a solipsistic flavor to this in the sense no, that... No, it's the opposite of that. Right? Well, it's, it's, a, you... it's an outside of the self. It's other things, right? You're you're not. The the pragmatists don't take that seriously as a philosophical problem. But, but I thought you just said that there was there there were no uh, other things. In other words, it's just what do you mean uh, by other, right? There's uh, there's clearly other things than me. My experience shows that the world is full of all kinds of things that are not me. Yes, but that's just a. Uh, a statement about your experience, right? So it's so not it's, just a statement about the experience. It's a statement about the world. See, about. if you keep saying that, I know, you, I, I you don't grasp pragmatism at all. It's a right. statement about the world. There are in the world many things. That's what I think most people would, common sense, would believe. Most people, I think, are common sense realists. Mm -hmm. The world has many, many things mm -hmm. in it. There's a tree. There's a stoplight. There's a road. There's me. There's you. There's my friend. All of these are different things. But but if we're if we're speaking precisely using the pragmatist language, we what that, we'd speak just like that, just like I did. That not, there's all these things. So right, the pragmatists are pluralist. The world is full of all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So if, if we were to try to knowingly put that in a, in a more analytic um, way, are you saying, so, so we say, the world is full of things from the pragmatist, like that sentence in, from the pragmatist standpoint is, I'm reporting on my experience that the world is full of, of things. No, you're not reporting on your experience. You're reporting that this is how the world is found to be by everyone who checks it out. But do, do you see what I'm trying to get at with the, there, it seems like there's some, uh, or when I'm not understanding this is what it is I'm not, I'm not able to understand the the 
uh, non-solipsistic version of that. If, if all you, like you... Right, the solipsism yeah. would be true if what you thought you were doing was reporting the contents of your own consciousness. That's where earlier empiricists okay. like Hume are led to. Okay, now what, so okay. what's the distinction so, between that? So and it's why William James writes this famous book called Radical Empiricism, okay. to separate himself from other kinds of empiricism, right? Okay. And so pragmatists do not think that what they're doing is reporting their own conscious states. They don't think okay. that they are somehow receiving simply their own impression, that I'm receiving my impressions, you're receiving yours, and we then lack a common uh -huh. world. Uh -huh. right? That's not what they think. They think experience shows, our living in the world shows, that we have in mind the same pen. That when you talk about a pen and I talk about a pen, we're talking about the same thing. Right Now, it, it could turn out to be different. Uh -huh. I could say, go get the pen, and you could walk across the room, and I would think, like, what's going on here? Right, But in general, we don't find ourselves in separate worlds. Mm-hmm. Right? Not fully separate worlds. So it, there's nothing solipsistic about it at all. I mean, I think pragmatism is the least solipsistic philosophy probably of all time. Just based on our experiences, which is, doesn't seem to right, be the case. Right, because, ex because the pragmatists think experience doesn't provide any evidence of solipsism. Right. right? It, again, solipsism is not just the view that there's something going on in, for me that you don't know about. It's that it's inaccessible to you, that we're both caught forever in our own little worlds that are not common. Mm -hmm. The pragmatist might think there's something going on about you that I don't know, but we can talk about it. Right? Just like I could say, like, how many pairs of but, white gym socks do I have in my closet? You don't know. But that you, doesn't mean that they're inaccessible. It just means you haven't checked it out yet. But what are you referencing when you are referencing me? You're just referencing experience, right? Again, I'm just referencing experience. <laughs> no, I'm referencing you. What is that? What, what are you? Yeah. Okay. Well, so again, we could define you in a bunch of ways, right? We could go to the chemist and say, what is you? And we could get one, you're, you're sort of this combination of these chemicals in this, right? Uh -huh. We could go to the historian and say, you're this person who was born here and then went to school there and lived here, and, right? We could do that. We could sort of do this in sort of a genetic way. You're the person who has the following strands of DNA, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we could define you politically, right? We could say, like, you're the person who's for this candidate, right? And so there's not one question that we're asked, right? Which is why if somebody says to you, who are you? The context matters, right? Sometimes the answer is, I'm so-and-so's son. Sometimes it's like, I'm the person who works for this. So in the, in the context that we find ourselves in right now, would you agree with something like this? This is all from your perspective, that what I am is... A young guy that's that's you're just having an experience that you're having a conversation with. Yeah, sure. Right, right. Which, <laughs> which right, which seems like I think what outside of philosophy class most people would say. Right, <laughs> right. you're sitting down at the coffee shop and there's somebody I'm talking to. Right, right. And it's like, is, is this person you? No, this person is other than me. Can we talk about the same things? Yes, frequently. So, but you don't have the belief based on your own experiences that. When I leave the room, I'm going to just, I'm just, I can disappear. I'm just a phantom out there. That I'm that I'm some kind of being, right? As some kind of person. Right. I think that I think that um, if people have that view, right, there's something sort of terribly wrong with them, because there is a huge amount of empirical data to suggest that doesn't happen. Right. If my view is that I'm talking with people, and the minute that they leave the room, they become phantoms and vanish. Right, that could be true. It would be empirically possible that that's true. It's just that there's no evidence to support that, and there's a lot of evidence on the other side. Right, so yes, the pragmatists would entertain that as a possibility, but it's very, very highly not warranted. Okay, so let me ask you, if I may, just a, yeah. a couple of questions sure. as we as we wrap up here. Yeah, yeah. So my own um, philosophy, as I'm sure you've gathered, based on my loose language, is kind of the exact opposite. Like I'm, even in the way I'm phrasing questions, it's like this this rationalism. I'm saying merely and just, and I'm, I'm right. uh, um, uh, poo pooing perhaps some of the right, sure. the kind of just in yeah, the language. Yeah. So from the rationalist approach, uh, or at least from my own, what I would say is um, it makes sense to assume that there is, like the world makes sense when I think of it as there is this external thing separate of, of me. And I believe that that's the, I can't know that it's the case, but I believe mm -hmm. it's the case just in my experience. I'm developing a theory to best explain the right. phenomena that I'm experiencing, that there right. is this three-dimensional place and it's inhabited by little 
uh, right. and, little people. And, and of course, if it's phenomena that you're experiencing, then it's not separate from you. Well, but so what I would say is my, the, oh, that, that's exactly where I wanted to go with this, but that's a, a better way of putting it. My, I find it very compelling and explanatory to think that there is something outside of my experience, that there is that separateness, that, uh -huh. that that seems to satisfactorily explain. Like if I were to try to make predictions based on that and understand it uh -huh. and try to understand the world that way, that that would be very uh, a plausible way of a very reasonable way of going right. about things. But you think that's mistaken. Well, it de again, it depends what you mean. When you say outside of your experience, if you mean that there are things that don't depend on you, I would say that's what our experience shows. Mm -hmm. right? well, how, so so uh, maybe I would say this, that there is, uh, there are some features of existence which I am not experiencing. Uh, 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 one hopes that that's true, and it seems obviously so. But I don't have any experience of it, so how, why, why would I say that? Right, so that sounds sort of like Donald Rumsfeld, of there's the, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Right? <laughs> and so there are things that you're not now experiencing that you have some knowledge of. Right. Yes, what about, but it also seems and, reasonable to say that there are things I don't even have knowledge of. Exactly, that are out there. exactly. And that's why the pragmatists think that inquiry is never done. Right? But why would we have that belief in the first place? Isn't that completely unjustified if we don't have any experience of it? No, no. We have a great deal of experience of it. We have a great deal of experience of the inadequacy of our own knowledge, of the world being more than we know. Yes, but, uh, but of, uh, of um, existent things that we have absolutely no experience, like some, some great way out in the cosmos that I just have no conception of anything. I have a positive belief that such types of but, things but exist. But you see, that's wrong because okay. you, you just conceived it. You said, I have no conception of it, and then you just described I, it as being way out in the I, cosmos. I have no conception of it outside of the most abstract so, qualifier, yeah. so which what is you're that saying it is, is existent. Yeah, so what you're saying is I have a very little conception of it. Well, do I have an experience of it? No, not yet. Well, so there's the, there's a difference then. There's a difference between the, ex, the experiential knowledge and conceptual knowledge. N n well, there are probably lots of differences between that, but not in the way that you mean it now. If you're saying um, there are things that I haven't discovered, that's both true of you individually, right? As a kid growing up, there's like things you haven't experienced, right? And it's also true of human beings generally, meaning we have experience of some things that Aristotle didn't have experience of. Right? And so the idea that there are things yet to be discovered is not an incoherent notion. It's completely linked to experience. It's just saying that these would be objects of a future experience. Right? But we don't have the experience. Not we don't have it yet. Okay, so let me... Those are things, right? Those are things waiting to be discovered. Well, so let me ask you this then, um, because this is very related. Absent um, conscious awareness and experience, like... It, if, if, there, if it were the case that there were no human beings, mm -hmm. would there be anything? Mm -hmm. So can I slightly, I want to see if this is like a friendly, uh, right? So what if we don't say human beings? What if we sort of say sentient beings? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so would there be any things? Yeah. No. Right? Depending upon what you mean by things, right? So if what you uh. mean by that is this, if you mean... What if uh, there was some uh, bomb that killed everyone off but left a bunch of stuff standing? Mm -hmm. Do we have reason to believe that then there would be a bunch of stuff standing? Yes. Mm -hmm. But that's not separate from experience. That's only later than experience. Mm -hmm. right? But there's no, there's no experiencer. There is an experiencer, but there is not an experiencer at that time. Right. This so is like this time. is like asking, as James points out, this is like asking, how do we know that they're dinosaurs? Because there there weren't any people back then. Well, but see, I would I would have a more uh, I think I would have a happier, um, Probably, easier time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not convinced <laughs> of that. Explaining the uh, from my in terms right. of my own evaluation right. to talk about the dinosaurs. And uh, so, what about absent any experiencer? It's kind of maybe even a better way than sentience. Just absent any experiencer. Isn't then you, then still... you wouldn't even be able to talk about a thing. You couldn't name a thing. You well, couldn't but, describe it. You well, couldn't use any word for it. But but that's only if we uh, presuppose the pragmatist starting point. No, that, no, no. That there are it, no independent it, things separate of our experience. No, see, again, that's not a very helpful way to put it. There are all kinds of things that are separate in many ways from us. Right? There's all kinds of independences. Our experience shows that there's all kinds of independences. Okay. Right. Well, but but they're not. But they're not independent of experience. 
per se of all experience. Well, that's that's what I was trying to right. get at. Was that yeah. that but one so, independent? Right, and so other. you have to be careful not to let the intuition, which is more than an intuition, it's verified all the time, that experience shows that our life shows that there's various kinds of independences of things. There's some things that don't depend on others. But but independent of experience is the key one that I was trying to get. Uh, yeah, I understand. And so yeah. what I'm trying to say is that something makes sense within experience is taken by many analytical philosophers or what you're calling rationalists as a claim about experience as a whole, which makes no sense whatsoever. I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Yeah. So the fact that a distinction makes sense within a framework, yes. right, within the framework of life or yes. experience or something, doesn't mean that those distinctions then make sense applied to the whole. But why do I think that that's the case? Why does it seem so intuitively reasonable to oh, think that that's okay, the case? Okay, so I, my, my guess is, right, so I, I, I don't know, right? I'd have to analyze you more, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know, right? But, but my guess is in talking with you, that it's the result of um, some philosophical training and some familiarities, right? And so that you have read in a certain tradition, and this way of thinking seems common. We all have we have habits of doing many things, including habits of thinking, right? And and the pragmatists are great on this because what they say is that there are people with different temperaments, and so James thinks there simply are sort of rationalistically oriented people. And it doesn't mean that those philosophies, it's why he's such a pluralist, it doesn't mean that those philosophies are wrong for them. It means this is how they make sense of the world, and right. the world in turn seems to confirm this way of thinking. There's other sorts of folks who think quite differently, right? And we can call them sort of more empirically yeah. minded folks, less rationalistic sorts of folks. And, and this kind of thing is going to be much closer to their intuitions, right? So this is now, kind of just a description well, but it's a way of sort of saying, like, why do people have the philosophical the views thing. that they have, yeah. right? And and at least for the pragmatist view, it's like they're not born with them. Mm -hmm. These are things that are developed, mm -hmm. and it depends upon the country and the culture and the education that you have, probably your family, a whole, a whole bunch of things, right. right? And one could say, okay, that's fine. Now we're an anthropologist. That explains why there's people around the world who think differently. Right. It explains why people in Tibet and people in... Georgia might think in a different way, right? And so then the question would be like, which one is right, right? And the pragmatists want to say that question about right is a question about, right, because these, right, all we've been doing is, right, we've been talking about like 1% of pragmatism, <laughs> yeah. the, the epistemology, <laughs> right? Right, and so because epistemology is a tiny little subset of ethics, they want to say, well, okay, what set of beliefs end up being most fulfilling? what end up, James talks about beliefs being cashed out in reality using that kind of Americanism on purpose, right? And and so it may then turn out that there's different people, right? And one way to look at this would be to sort of say, why would it be any more surprising um, that there are two people who hold different philosophical worldviews, say, than there would be that there's two people who disagree about what the best music is? Some people might say, I prefer to listen to jazz, mm -hmm. and somebody else says, I like listening to hip hop. Right, and so the primary say it doesn't mean that one of them is right and the other is wrong. Right, it means that these views function in people's experience in different ways. So then, what's the response to piggybacking specifically off that? If a pragmatist were to hear a, uh, a, um, I guess I like the term rationalist, but we right, can sure that's fine. Yeah, they um, use the term all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if so, so how would you respond to something like the rationalists who might say? The pragmatic approach to understanding and interpreting your experiences is something which is objectively wrong. Would right. they say that that's a, just hubris on the part of the rationalist, or that that's that's just their uh, way of going about? Yeah, it? Yeah, hubris uh, applied as a personality trait, maybe so, mm -hmm. right? Uh, maybe hubris, but also just wrong. Right? Meaning, like flat out wrong. And so, several of the pragmatists, William James, is a good example. Uh, really spends his life arguing against rationalists that their arguments don't work. He's very careful. He's very analytical. He takes about those arguments and shows like these arguments don't reach the yeah, conclusion. Oh, so no, I just said the, the right. And so part of the pragmatist view here is that you cannot prove any philosophy. Right. This is a pragmatist like central point. You you cannot prove any philosophy, including pragmatism, yeah. in theory. There is no philosopher's lecture. There's no philosophy book that can be written. There's no argument that can be given, 
that shows that a philosophy is correct right. any more than it could show that a particular scientific claim is correct. The pragmatists say this would have to be, we would have to ask ourselves, what do we find in life? What consequences do we find? Well, then that's what I want to say. Can we apply pragmatism to pragmatism? Yeah, right. And so the, right, and exactly. And the pragmatists do apply pragmatism to pragmatism. They're one of the few philosophies, I think, that actually are self-consistent that way. And it's why they end up being pluralists, right? So that they don't claim anybody who is not a pragmatist is therefore wrong. But didn't you just claim that about the rationalists? No, the, what, the, what the rationalists, I believe, generally we can talk about which, which folks we're talking yeah. about, right? But what, yeah. what rationalism tends to believe, <clears throat> at least historically, is that it can present arguments as arguments, as theories, as philosophies that show that other philosophies are mistaken. Yes. Okay. That's what pragmatism denies. But isn't that what it's isn't that what it's doing? Isn't no, that a self-contradiction? No, what, no, no. It's not pragmatic. At no point in any of the pragmatist writing do they believe that they have made the case for pragmatism. Well, but the, it, they're if presenting they're making a, the case against rationalism. And they're they not the making the thing? case against rationalism. Okay. They're making the case against rationalism's foreclosing other possibilities. But say that that's a central tenet of rationalism. That's what. Yeah, which is why then they're showing that that view is wrong. But I thought you said. You they're not showing that it's wrong in theory. They're showing that it's wrong in practice, right? In other words, what the pragmatist oh, says, okay. what the pragmatist says is to you that the ultimate test of any belief, whether we call it rationalist, pragmatist, anything else doesn't matter. It could be about pens, cliffs, movies, whatever. The test of this, the determination of whether a belief is true or false, is going to be a matter of consequences, okay? Right? Not origins. So, can right? I try what are the results that we get, okay. right? And their view is: so, if someone says, sort of like you do. Uh, I uh, hold to this rationalist philosophy, yeah. and I find it makes sense of the world, and it allows me to operate well, and um, yeah, it works, right? The pragmatist is going to say that claim that it works for you—that's a pragmatist claim, right? right? Okay, so can I? I yeah. So last thing here, I want to try yeah. to rephrase that, um, and if I do it inaccurately, please. <laughs> sure. <laughs> So the pragmatist is saying that there is no way to prove in theory yes. that a particular epistemology is true, objectively true. Right. That even, okay. Yeah. Isn't that itself a theoretical claim about epistemology? Right. It would be, it could be taken that way. Yeah. Right. Which would be a kind of anti-pragmatist way to understand it. Or it could be taken a pragmatic way as a claim about does experience show that this is so or not. So, okay, so would you say that this, that even the way that a rationalist might frame the question is, um, is kind of an error. Even the question of can you develop this um, true epistemology, objectively true epistemology, is presupposing that there is theoretically a possibility of doing that in the first place. Yeah, uh, what I would say, if we were going to put this in sort of... Um not very, but a little more technical philosophy yeah. terminology was, right? What I would be saying is that I think the pragmatists are very good at showing how uh, rationalist philosophers smuggle in, uh, smuggle in premises yeah. uh, that they need to actually establish and can't just start out using. So that yes. a lot of this philosophy looks, again, in, in philosophy language as a kind of very learned begging of the question. Right. Okay. So, and this is, this is my sticking point then. Um, isn't theory inescapable though? Because aren't, isn't the pragmatist still making theoretical presuppositions? Theorizing is inescapable, at least for anybody who wants to try to deal with the world in a, an effective way, right? And so the question, uh, pragmatists are in, in no way anti-theorists. Mm -hmm. Pragmatism is a theory. That's why it's got the ism right, attached to it, right? So it's not that theory as such is wrong, right? It's that theory understood in one way turns out to be wrong. But isn't that still so? Does, right, that, that is a theory. And yeah. then the question is, does experience show that to be so or not? Right. And, and the primary answer is, yeah, it does show that to be so. Okay. Right. And, and so we could ask the same kinds of things about science, right? We could yeah. say, well, if you're setting up a physical experiment here, doesn't that assume some thing, right? It's like, yeah. yes, it does, right? There's no, every act of reasoning is an inference, which means it starts somewhere and goes someplace else. But, but I guess, I guess the, the specifically the pragmatist claim of the inaccuracies of the rationalist strikes me as presupposing rationalism yeah, not, in a sense, right? Not, not the inaccuracies, but of the incoherence of the project of by pure theory 
proving or disproving a philosophical way of life. And you're saying you're not, by criticizing that, you're not, you're not appealing to a theory, you're appealing to our experiences. Yeah, what the, what the pragmatists essentially do is two things, right? So if you can imagine two audiences. One audience is a bunch of philosophers, right? It's like that's sort of a grim audience, but there it is, <laughs> right? And what they're essentially doing there is carrying on in the same way that lawyers might talk to other lawyers or doctors talking to other doctors. They're having a kind of conversation of specialists, right? right? And what they're doing there is to say, in, in, in lots of ways, through lots of books, what they're essentially doing is saying, your arguments against us do not work on your own terms. Right. We will show you that your logical arguments fail. Right. Having failed, that doesn't show that anybody's right or wrong. It just shows these criticisms, these arguments don't work. They then turn toward a different audience of uh, the proverbial man on the street, the non-academic philosopher, or at least the non-academic philosopher, qua-academic philosopher, and they say, so uh, this view that we're offering up isn't ruled out by logic. It is a logically possible hypothesis. Let's see whether your experience confirms it. If your experience confirms it, cool, so much the better for pragmatism. If it doesn't, then you are some other, you're uh, a rationalist, for example. Yeah. It, they then look at those people and think, like, does that mean that this is like a tribe of fallen, you know, false believing folks? No. They think this is a group of people who, who temperamentally are different from pragmatists who see the world differently. So you're saying there is essentially no the purely theoretical argument that is going to convince you of rationalism. Not, not just the, lack of a better right. Term. So con convincing sounds like a rhetorical thing, right? So like, will somebody be well, pers convinced? Persuaded, persuaded. Right, which also sounds rhetorical, right? Like, let me persuade you, let me manipulate you, right? And okay. the, the question is, logically, it never works. Okay. Right? That you can never prove any kind of rationalist conclusion without invoking rationalist premises. And, will and that be statement the doesn't presuppose rationalist premises in saying that? No, it's just an exam. Right? It's, why, it's why the pragmatist can only say this as a generalization, not as an absolute claim. In other okay. words, right? it's like, bring me, an, bring your, okay, bring but, me but your next it's, argument. But if it's, not an, if it's not a certain claim, then... Right, then it's then, warranted then, but, and there's no certainty to it. But if there's no certainty to it, then can't we say it might be possible then? Yeah, it, it, right. And the pragmatist will always say, again, if I it's not it logical... impossible. No, no. All, all I mean by impossible is that there has been no possibility demonstrated. Okay, so right? it's, so The it's pragmatist not... has to always say, right, with sort of like a great weariness and a shrug, the pragmatist has to say, okay, rationalist, you know, bring on your next argument. So it, let's so see. It's, if, if, you'll, if you'll forgive the presupposition, it's theoretically possible, oh, sure. but there's no evidence for it. Yet. Yeah, and the, right, and the pragmatist thinks it's theoretically possible. Right? Okay. J James says at one point that probably the philosopher he most disagrees with, Hegel, may turn out to be right. He's just saying that the evidence for that now is slim, almost non-existent. Okay. okay. So the, the pragmatist here is a kind of thoroughgoing experimentalist. Okay. So I want to just say before we end, I want to okay. just say one other thing okay. that is not like a question that you've asked so you can okay. shut me off, right? So somebody, and, and again, it's just kind of, it's uh, interesting to me that this has been on sort of like the, what I view as sort of, sort of like these little epistemological issues, right? But, but somebody could wonder um, why, right? So the pragmatic question would be, why does this matter? Right? right. Like, who cares? Exactly. What's, what's at stake here, right? And right, one answer could be, this is just a bunch of specialists talking shop and <laughs> trying to clear up some fine points, right? Okay. And for most of us, it doesn't matter, and nothing hangs on this, and... Yeah, well, I hardly understand what they're talking about and why are they so heated about these things, but, you know, let them be, right? And, and so if, if that were the case, right, in other words, if one is a pragmatist and looks at these issues in epistemology and thinks this is just a little bit of theoretical quibbling, again, pragmatically, it doesn't make any practical difference. So it would be kind of like saying, well, that's a bad theory, but okay. No right? And so pragmatists wouldn't worry about that, right? If they just thought faulty epistemologies and metaphysical views are just faulty epistemologies and metaphysical views, leave them over there and let them be, they're wrong, but, but you know, so what? Right? But so the whole thrust of pragmatism here is that um, faulty epistemologies are not just faulty epistemologies, that actually a lot more is at stake, that what happens is 
all kinds of uh, political and moral values get smuggled into epistemologies and to metaphysical views. And so, again, logic is a subset of ethics. Ethics, because humans are social, is a subset of politics. So the pragmatists look at many of these other epistemologies that they view as non-experimental, and they think those are linked to non-democratic cultures. They look at them as authoritarian and having privileged access and think these are linked to political systems that are sexist or racist or exclusionary in various kinds of ways. Right? And so I, I just want to stress that ultimately for the pragmatists, differences between epistemologies for the pragmatists take on their greatest significance when seen in a political context. Right. right? And, and questions about who's authorized to determine truth or falsity and whose evidence counts, right? And things like that loom large for them. There uh, is so much fertile material in there. Yeah, I feel so, like I could talk to you all well, day. Yeah, I could talk to you. I appreciate that. So but I, I, I just want to stress that yes. um, I think that for, you know, uh, poor people who stumble on some of these debates, that it's easy to sort of think like, wow, this is really up in the clouds and I don't know really what they're talking about, but they, they seem to be having a heated time of it, <laughs> right? And, and the prime minister actually resonate with that and what they want to do is to show that these are differences that cash out in people's lives in yes. various kinds of ways. That is, an, so, that is an excellent point, and it's a wonderful note to, to end sure, on, the, great. The, the practicality of philosophy, which I think a lot of people dismiss yeah. out of hand. They say it's useless, and I am in total agreement is it's a big deal. Right. So in conclusion, are there any... Uh, like book recommendations that you would give for people who are interested in pragmatism and you know, want you want to explore the ideas that we've been talking about. Sure, right. And so that's, you know, it's always dangerous to ask a, a professor, like, can you recommend books? Because the answer is like, yes, I have a shelf of stuff, right? <laughs> okay, so, about the top. Right. But so, you know, I would say that if, if people wanted to um, kind of look at the, the short uh, greatest hits collection of, of pragmatism, right, I, I would say... Uh, one interesting place to start is kind of the, the early origins of pragmatism in some of the essays of Emerson. So I would say read things like The American Scholar, read Self-Reliance, read his essay Experience. And these are things that are not written for an academic audience. And so even though they're uh, a century and a half old, they have a kind of vitality. Um, you know, the Bible of pragmatism, I suppose, is probably William James's book, Pragmatism. Right. So the, uh, and that's a bunch of public lectures, and one of the nice things about James is he's not writing for professors. He's writing to be heard, to give lectures. And in these days, it's kind of amazing. It, we can't capture James. James went around the country, and he was like a rock star of his era. And thousands of people would come and sit in the audience, and he spoke to people who are not academic. So I would say that would be that would be one place to look at, right? And then going from the earliest to sort of the, the classical high point to sort of the latest, Right. If I if I don't, you know, uh, I'll uh, I'll be good enough not like to cite my own books. Right. But I would say a book that's very accessible that shows some of the political uh, force of this is Richard Rorty's book, Achieving Our Country, which maybe has a special um, vitality, uh, you know, around elections and, and politics uh, in the world today. Also pretty accessible. So those would be three things I think would be yeah. useful. And, and and one last thing, and that is to say, I, I think that what you said um, about the value or usefulness of philosophy is is very much true and very, very important. And, and I think there it's really important to distinguish between um, academic philosophy, some of which may not be so important, and philosophy understood in a broader, more living sense that certainly is. Mm -hmm. So there are definitely things about my discipline and some of my colleagues. I'm not sure, you know, how important some of that is. But I think philosophy in the broader sense yes. of, of the way that we, the worldview that we have, yes. that's very, very important. Yeah. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. Well, thank you. <laughs> I have greatly enjoyed this. All right, so that was my interview with Dr. John Stewart, who is the Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at Emory University. Wow, what an interview. I wasn't overstating it. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed being there. I kept him longer than I originally said when I was scheduling the interview with him, so he was kind enough to sit down and answer most of my questions. I feel like we could have talked for another several hours on the topic. But if you like this style of interview and you like the depth 
that we're getting to in these conversations, please make sure to subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher. Tell your friends, share it around. And if you want to help support the creation of the show, then make sure you head over to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson. You can become a patron of the show, which simply means that whenever I release new content like this, you pledge $1 of support. And as more people hear about the show and pledge their support, it's going to allow this show to continue indefinitely in the future. So thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.